Good day everyone! Today, we are tackling about interpretation and data analysis from Module 5, Lesson 1. First, let us know the definition and concept of data analysis in research to completely understand it. Data analysis. It is a way of simplifying numerous and wordy data to a meaningful story and interpreting it to arrive at an insight to behold. In short, it's a way to interpret various information and convey it to something more comprehensible for other people to easily understand the message it wants to give. Second, it is also a process of converting a multitude data into a smaller group of sensible data. There were times when you'll have multiple data and you'll have to derive for the important ideas for people to easily grasp the information the data wanted to give. Since data analysis is a process, it involves several stages that needs to undergo for easier deriving. Here are the stages of data analysis. First, you must organize the data you have gathered. Arrange it in an understandable way for you to accomplish the next task at ease. Next is to summarize and categorize the data together. It can be based on their similarities and differences. It depends on the goal of your research. Through data analysis, you can find patterns and themes to identify and link ideas. Lastly, is to analyze the data from start to finish, where it entails the interpretation of the data to easily understand and explain the result of gathered data. Most beginner researchers find data analysis very tasking and time-consuming because it's hard to navigate the data, especially if it has vague data. Therefore, you have to thoroughly scrutinize the data to derive a clear, well-structured, and meaningful data as a result. Now, we'll focus on the needs of analyzing data in research. Here are the importance of data analysis. For a researcher to tell a story about a problem solved, large-scale data might be too boring and complex for the spectators. Although they rely mainly on data, it doesn't give a clear picture or answer, making it hard to understand. It says that well-analyzed data will reveal patterns that may be interesting and worth exploring as it can be insightful for different circumstances in our surrounding. This will give a bigger and meaningful data. Second is, organize and analyze data that can guide the researcher to find patterns and provide shape to explanations about what you are trying to prove in the past or present events and what might happen in the future. An open-minded researcher must remain unbiased in the gathered data, and eventually, patterns may arise unexpectedly. Remember that data analysis can sometimes reveal the most unexpected yet intriguing stories of or findings. Next is data analysis in qualitative and quantitative research. Data analysis in qualitative research usually involves text, braces, images, objects, and symbols to easily picture out descriptions, while in quantitative research, it involves the usage of numbers and statistics to explain a phenomenon. Statistical analysis is the core quantitative of analysis, which deals with basic calculations including average and median, to more sophisticated an analyses like correlation and regressions. Let's now talk about inferential statistics. This aims to make inferences about the population and here are two common types of predictions. First is prediction between groups and an example of this is the weight differences between learners group according to their favorite meals. 
The second is relationships between variables, which an example of this is the relationship between body weight and the number of hours a week a person does Zumba dance. In other words, inferential statistics allows you to connect the dots and make predictions based on what you observe in your sample data. Here are some of the common inferential methods you might apply in your study. First is the t-test, wherein you are simply looking at the difference between the means and dividing that difference by variance. The sample size of this test is lesser than 30 and it also have different types. There are one sample t-test for comparing data to the mean of some known population and the independent sample t-test for comparing data from two separate non-related samples and dependent sample t-test for comparing data from related groups. This is most often used when you have pre-test or post-test setup. Second is ANOVA, also known as analysis of variance, which is almost the same with t-test. However, this compares multiple means at the same time. This allows you to compare the effects of different factors on the same measure. It also has different forms. First is one-way ANOVA for comparing three or more groups along same dimension. Next is within groups ANOVA for comparing data from related groups and factorial ANOVA for when you have two or more variables and you want to explore if there are interaction between the factors. Third is correlation analysis. It is a statistical method used to measure the strength of the linear relationship between two variables and their association. Correlation analysis calculates the level of change in one variable due to the other change in other. Last is regression analysis. This allows you to make prediction about an outcome based on knowledge about some predictor variable. There are also several regression tests, such as simple linear, multiple linear, logistic, nominal, and ordinal regression, which differs on the number of predictor and outcome. We'll now try to interpret a table from the unpublished research paper of Ms. Christy G. Dablo entitled Teenage Pregnancy and Its Interventions Minimizing Future Risk Among High School Students. As you may notice, the respondents' responses were about fear, worries, and apprehensions. They showed emotions after learning that they were pregnant at an early age. Fear were evident as they think on how their parents might react to the shame they brought up. There's hopelessness that the baby shattered their dreams and on how they will raise the child knowing that they are incapable of supporting themselves. It brought worry and end up thinking about aborting the child. According to Enyege on 2004, teenagers were <clears throat> raised in a culture where parents are really afraid to bring up the topic to their kids or at risk of early pregnancy. Many teens worry about what their family's thoughts, so they avoid telling their parents. For the next table, Suppose a study is conducted to one of the companies in El Salvador City, Misamis Oriental, to determine the factors affecting customer preferences among the residents of one barangay of El Salvador City, ages from 22 to 60 years old. These are the following data given. The first table reveals that 45.33% of the respondents 
are in the age bracket of 21 to 30 years old, compared to only 9.3% in ages 51 to 61 years old and above, while 21.33% belong to the 31 to 40 age range. This age profile reflects the current age demographic for the Filipinos according to PSA, or Philippine Statistics Authority. There is much younger cohort of teachers entering the workforce. There is much younger cohort who has the capacity to purchase products and services. While Table 2 shows that 61.33% of the respondents are female, compared to 38.67% males. This, the representative of the current gender distribution of the population in the Philippines, according to PSA in 2015, of the total population in the Philippines, 50.40% are males and the rest are females. Skelton, in 2012, stated that, Gender distribution is common among countries where male becomes more in population than female. That's all for interpretation and data analysis. Thank you for listening.